Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. We will now be commencing the lecture. In a little while, we will be commencing the lecture. We have as our speaker today, as you may know, engineer Dr. Priyanta Vijay Tunga, who is working as the principal energy specialist at the South Asia Department of the Asian Development Bank. We have dedicated this uh, lecture to the memory of late engineer DJ Vimana Surendra, who is, supposed, who is uh, known as the pioneer of the development of hydroelectricity in our country. Today is his 141st birth anniversary. Today our president is not in a position to be here with us because he has to attend the annual general meeting of the Sabaragamuga Provincial Chapter. So in his place we have the president-elect engineer Milasena Gamage. Now the, now the speaker in a little while will be accompanied into the hall with, by the presidential party. As they arrive, I would request you to rise up from your seats. They are about to enter the hall and kindly remain standing till they take up their seats at the stage. You can now kindly rise up from your seats. Now the first item in our program today is the lighting of the ceremonial oil lamp. For that I would uh, call upon engineer Vimala Sena Gamange, the president-elect. Engineer Professor Dayanta Vijay Sekara, past president. Engineer Sam Karna, Dr. Professor Sam Karnaratna, past president. And also Mr. Nuan uh, Vimala Surendra, the son of late, uh, grandson of, great grandson of late, uh, Engineer Vimala Surendra and Engineer Kosala Kambradaniya, the Chairman, Electrical Engineering Section of the Thank you. I would now call upon May I would invite Engineer Mirasena Gambage to garland the photograph of uh, late Engineer Vimala Surendra. Thank you. Um, I would invite the President elect, Engineer Ibrasena Gamage, the Speaker, Professor Dr. Priyanta Vijayatunga, and uh, Engineer Kosala Kaburadani to come up to the stage and take their seats. We will now move on to the next item in the program that is the welcome address. I would invite the President-elect, Engineer Kamage, to formally welcome you and introduce the speaker to the audience.
good evening. On behalf of the President of ISL Engineer SP Vijay Kohan, I have to deliver the welcome address. Past Presidents, Engineer Priyanta D.C. Getunga, our speaker today, Vice Presidents, Chairman of Electrical and Electronic Sectional Committee, uh, Council Members, uh, Family Members of late Engineer D.J. Vimal Surendra, Distinguished Invitees, Fellow Engineers, Ladies and Gentlemen. I consider it is my privilege to welcome all of you to the memorial lecture of late engineer DJ Vijay Vimal Surendra. Today, we all are gathered here as a members of the Learn Society to pay tribute to late engineer DJ Vijay Surendra, father of the hydropower in Sri Lanka. It is our responsibility to educate the present generation, especially the engineer fraternity on how our forefathers dedicated their service to develop our country in a sustainable manner despite to the economic and social constraints. This lecture, instituted in 1989, it is, is in memory of late engineer DJ Vimal Surendra. Today is, the, today is his 101st birthday, 141 birthday anniversary and this is the 26th memorial lecture being held. Engineer Deyap Gyasena, Vimala born in 1874 in Gaul, was educated at Ananda College, Colombo, excelling in science and mathematics. He joined the Technical College in Colombo in 1893 while serving as an apprentice at the government factory and was its first graduate in civil engineering. He completed his engineering studies in 1898 by sitting for the examination conducted in India by the Institution of Civil Engineers, UK. Engineer Vimal Surendra worked for some times as an assistant civil engineer at then Public Works Department serving at stations like Dietalava, Gaul and Novot. He, the Demodar Loop was designed and constructed by him in 1901 while being stationed at Dietalava. It was during the service at the PWD Public Works Department that he became interested in hydropower projects. In 1912, he proceeded to UK to specialize in electrical engineering and gain Friday house diploma in seven months and also gaining associate membership of the Institu Institution of Electrical Engineers in Britain. Having had this, his initial uh, proposal on hydropower ignored by engineering association Sloan, our predecessor, he constructed Ceylon's first small hydropower station in Blackpool between Nuareli and Nanue to supply the electricity to the Nuareli town. In 1918, he presented his historic paper titled Economics of Power Utilization in Ceylon before the, before the then Engineering Association of Ceylon arguing the case for development of hydro potential of the country. He also strongly promoted the electrification of the railway as well as concept of developing a national grid. He was a chartered engineer of both the institution of civil engineers UK as well as institution of electrical engineers UK, a somewhat rare achievement at that time. He did in-depth study of Lakshapana hydroelectrical power projects which are government accepted in principle for implementation in 1924. However, it took another 15 years for the government to decide on its actual implementation. He was, however, left, left out of the project and left the country on leave to England and returned only on the request of the colonial secretary. In 1926, he was appointed as chief engineer of public works department soon after he began the separation of the electrical uh, section. With the setting up of the Department of Government Electrical Undertakings, Engineer Vimal Surendra was appointed to the position of Chief Engineer. However, he retired as a frustrated man at the age of 52 5 in 1929 with his pet project in abeyance. In view of the promoting his vision and determination to develop the hydropower potential of the country, Engineer Vimal Surendra decided to enter the National State Council and was elected from Ratnapura in 1931 as the member of the for Ratnapura seat for 
four and a half years and served in the Executive Committee of Works and uh, Communication. He lobbied for the reception of works on hydropower that was uncompleted. As a result, the Raksapan hydropower scheme, which had started in 1924 and had been stopped, was resumed in 1938 and they completed after the war in 1950. In 1933, he proposed the formation of Central Electrical Authority. In 1935, the National State Council passed the Electrical, Electrical Board Establishment Ordinance No. 38 of 1935. However, the board was dissolved in 1977 and the Department of General Electrical Undertaking established, re-established. During the period from 1931 to 36, as a member of the State Council, he continued to advocate strongly the rapid uh, in industrialization of the country using the cheap source of power, hydroelectricity. Engineer Vimal Surendra was almost 75 years of age when in 1950 the Lakshapan project was finally completed. Engineer Vimal Surendra, the father of the hydroelectricity in Sri Lanka, passed away on August 10, 1953. The Norton Power House was named after his him in 1974, Professor C. Sundaralingam, his colleagues in the State Council, paid the best tribute to him when he said, Vimala Surendra is not dead. He is a living light, Lakshapana, a lack of light. With that remarks, today we have, we have as our speaker, to deliver the engineer DJ Vimala Surendra Memorial Lecture, engineer Dr. Priyanta Vijayatunga, another veteran electrical engineering expert, Actually, he travelled all the way from Manila to deliver this lecture. Again, I warmly welcome you on behalf of the ISF. Dr. Priyanta Vijay Sundara graduated in with first class honours from the University of Moratua, specialised in electrical engineering in 1992. He obtained the PhD in power economics from the Imperial College, London, where he held the postgraduate scientific research fellowship for the doctoral studies. He joined the Asian Development Bank ADB in 2008 and present, is presently principal energy specialist. He was a senior professor of electrical engineering at University of Moratu and founder dean of the Faculty of Information Technology. Dr. V. Tunga in 2003 became the founder director general of Public Utilities Commission of Sri Lanka. He also served as a member of the Ceylon Electricity Board. He was the chairman Southeast Asia Forum for Infrastructure Regulation 2006. He is a chartered engineer and corporate member of IET London and fellow of the Institute of Engineers Sri Lanka and he was one about few years back represent the council under 40 members. Also he is a senior member of the IEE. -I -E. He involved in processing key energy sector loans in Bangladesh, India, Maldives, Nepal and Sri Lanka. He has been the ad ADB focal point for regional energy cooperation in South Asia since 2008. He has experience in energy sector policy making, regulatory and climate change activities over 25 years and has, uh, has authorized over 75 publications including over 25 referred international journal publications in the field of energy. He is a leader, lead author of the ADB publication on energy trade in South Asia opportunities and challenges. Dr. Pian Vijay Tunga, you are so fortunate enough to deliver the prestigious Vijay, Sundara, Vijay Surendra Memorial Lecture today and your chosen topics, regional cooperation for the clean energy development, increased electricity access and inner supply security is more appropriate in time for the sustainable development of a country, especially under the new development strategies of the new government. On behalf of the ESL, I cordially invite Engineer Priyanta Vijayatunga to deliver the Engineer Vimalasura Memorial Lecture today. Thank you very much. President-elect IESL, the Chairman of the uh, Electrical Engineering Sectional Committee, Honorable members of the uh, Council of uh, IESL, the officials of uh, IESL, and the past presidents of IESL, and uh, distinguished invitees, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon to all of you. Um, as uh, President Elect quite rightly said, uh, uh, 
it's a great pleasure to be here delivering this uh, very important uh, memorial lecture, uh, one of the most important uh, memorial lectures in the IESR calendar. Uh, when I was invited by the uh, chairman of the uh, electrical engineering section of committee to deliver this uh, lecture, I thought I should select a topic which is uh, uh, most relevant uh, to the uh, hydropower sector uh, which uh, engineer DJ Vimalu Surendra pioneered uh, in Sri Lanka. And also I thought it's uh, quite appropriate that uh, whatever topic I am going to take up should uh, more or less uh, deliver, uh, more or less deliver the kind of benefits what uh, the hydropower sector itself delivered to Sri Lanka. And of course, naturally it has got to be uh, something uh, relevant to my field uh, where I work in. So, and I ended up selecting regional cooperation for clean energy development, uh, increased uh, energy access and uh, enhanced supply security as, as, as the topic for the day. So with that kept in mind, uh, let me quickly outline uh, what I am going to present an introduction to the topic which I am going to deal with uh, and also how it is going to fit into uh, the, uh, the relevance of hydropower sector in Sri Lanka and how they are related, uh, the topic and, and the hydropower development in Sri Lanka. And then uh, re how regional cooperation is going to help in the same manner as it helped, uh, uh, hydro as hydropower sector helped in Sri, uh, uh, Sri Lanka uh, for many, many years. And let me quickly look at uh, what uh, the situation of South Asia power sector is at the moment. Because if you are talking of regional cooperation, we need to uh, find out uh, what's happening in the region if you really need to uh, go for regional cooperation. And then uh, let me uh, talk a little bit about the benefits uh, in quantified form. And then uh, what are the barriers we have to deal with? Uh, when it comes to regional cooperation in the energy sector and how we are going to overcome uh, these barriers. And few final remarks basically to wrap up uh, with some of my thoughts on uh, what we need to uh, do uh, to move forward in this particular uh, area. Um, I do not have to uh, reiterate what hydropower sector has uh, done in Sri Lanka and how much it has helped over the years. And this is a sector, as uh, President Riddick quite rightly uh, uh, mentioned, uh, a large, the Lai hydropower sector was pioneered by uh, engineer DJ uh, Vibhala Surendra. Uh, and uh, that has helped over the years uh, enormously uh, the development of Sri Lanka. Uh, to start off with, uh, as you all uh, know, it is an indigenous uh, uh, source of primary energy which is used to uh, generate electricity which means uh, it is ours, we do not have to import uh, that energy uh, to generate electricity. That is one of the most important aspects of hydropower uh, in Sri Lanka. And then uh, uh, it, it has been able to serve uh, this country for many, many years to uh, uh, meet the increasing uh, electricity demand over the years. And as you know, uh, until uh, 1990s, in fact, if I can remember right, until early 1990s, uh, it was almost uh, uh, supplying the total electricity demand in the country. Uh, of course, as the demand grew, uh, naturally the uh, Sri Lanka had to diversify into other sources of energy. But uh, still, uh, hydropower, uh, uh, you know, remains as, as one of the critical inputs to the uh, electricity generation contribution uh, in the country. Then. Uh, if you look at uh, the amount of uh, foreign exchange savings which has resulted in uh, 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 as a result of this uh, uh, hydropower use, naturally uh, it replaced uh, alternative fossil fuel sources which are all will have to be imported if we were to uh, uh, go for those fossil fuel based generation plants. So it has saved a lot of money and uh, those electrical engineers who are sitting here from the Ceylon electricity board know very well, even today hydropower sector in Sri Lanka, uh, you know, helps uh, to uh, bring down the average cost of supply uh, of, uh, in Sri Lanka 
and of course that will be has uh, more or less reduced the burden on the electricity board because of course the electricity board sells electricity at, at a price lower than the cost of supply so whatever you uh, bring in from hydropower sector basically saves money for CEB and eventually the country so that has served uh, you know in that sense uh, quite a lot and then if you look at uh, rapid expansion of the electrification program in the country uh, over the years I'm sure uh, the hydropower sector development has even uh, you know directly and indirectly helped uh, for that uh, rapid electrification program as you know we are now more or less 98% uh, electrified in the country 98% of the households electrified and we are uh, you know well ahead of all the other neighbors in, in South Asia except probably Maldives which is 100% electrified but if you look at the overall quality of electrification in Sri Lanka is we are far ahead of all these uh, countries and of course we have been able to reach as a result the rural and underprivileged households which uh, with itself is an achievement uh, uh, and it has definitely been contributed by the hydropower sector in Sri Lanka. So it has done an enormous service uh, to this country and uh, so let's look at uh, how uh, a similar uh, contribution can be made uh, through other uh, you know uh, through the topic which I was going to talk about today that's regional cooperation in the energy sector in South Asia and uh, as you can see here South Asia is sitting on roughly about 300,000 megawatts of hydroelectricity uh, in the region and in fact uh, this is uh, economic potential not uh, technical potential that's enormous uh, amount of hydropower in the region and out of this of course uh, quite a lot is sitting in uh, India 150,000 megawatts and if you look at Pakistan about 45,000 megawatts if you look at Nepal 42,000 megawatts and uh, Bhutan 30,000 these are uh, the countries having the largest uh, pot hydropower potential in the region you can see it's an enormous hydropower potential which needs to be developed uh, for the benefit of the region and in addition to this uh, you see a large potential of wind solar and biomass uh, uh, you know energy uh, in in the, in the same region and i have not since i am talking about clean energy i don't want to go into details of other forms of energy but if you look at uh, the uh, potential uh, rather the reserves of fossil fuels in the region also quite a lot if you look at coal power coal uh, resources we have quite a lot of coal resources in in uh, india and and uh, pakistan and also uh, gas resources in, in uh, Bangladesh of course which are depleting but Pakistan has a lot of gas resources and so on so this the South Asia region is sitting on uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, primary energy sources which are clean if you can see uh, here and if you look at uh, the utilization of this only a fraction of this clean energy has been exploited to date now for instance Nepal has 42,000 megawatts of hydropower potential economic potential and it has exploited only about 800 megawatts less than 800 700 something and if you look at Bhutan it's uh, roughly about 2,000 odd uh, uh, megawatts and it has 30,000 megawatts of course uh, if you look at India India has about 150,000 out of which about 35,000 megawatts or so uh, 45,000 megawatts or so have been uh, developed uh, and at the same time if you look at India uh, wind power you have 35,000 megawatts uh, this is uh, 2015 July numbers and then solar power uh, another 4,000 megawatts in India but if you look at the potential of hydropower wind solar and perhaps even biomass it's enormous potential in the region and uh, this is something which we have not tapped uh, to date and which we can uh, uh, make use of for the benefit of the region as a whole but unless you have regional cooperation you have to develop this for individual countries use naturally as you can see we are talking about only some of the countries in South Asia here and which means unless you have regional cooperation you cannot uh, share these resources across the borders so at the same time why we need to develop this for the benefit of the region if you look at uh, the region itself you have over 300 million people without access to electricity uh, in the region and in fact uh, that's uh, quite a large number 
uh, in the region. And in fact, even uh, uh, those who have access to electricity do not uh, have, uh, you know, the quality of supply uh, required. Poor quality of supply and uh, daily and se seasonal shortages. In fact, if you go to some of the areas in India, you may have electricity supply only for about four to eight hours. If you go to Nepal, if you look at uh, uh, if during the uh, winter season when the when the rivers run dry, uh, you have power shortages as long as about 20 hours. I have I have been in Kathmandu when the power shortage used to be 20 hours, so only four hours electricity and you don't have enough electricity even to charge your batteries, your laptop. So it's a major issue. So but we are sitting in enormous amount of hydropower resources in these countries. So to summarize the situation in, 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 uh, in South Asia, I haven't uh, uh, gone into so much of detail of Afghanistan and Pakistan, but it has got uh, a lot of uh, access to a huge uh, hydropower resources in the Central Asia region. In fact, if you look at Central Asian countries, you have a lot of hydropower resources. And at the same time, they are experiencing severe power shortages, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And if you look at Nepal and Bhutan, as I said, they have severe power shortages in Nepal. And if you look at Bangladesh, the issue in Bangladesh is it's again shortages but also it has it is heavily dependent on gas and uh, gas uh, shortages are also uh, there and, and uh, that has uh, uh, given rise to problems and their plans are to uh, develop large coal power and Sri Lanka again at the moment of course uh, heavy reliance of uh, first, you know liquid fuel and even now and if you look at Maldives it's scattered islands uh, and again heavy reliance on diesel and if you look at India India itself uh, is in fact heavily dependent on coal and uh, still power shortages and uh, coal, sh coal shortages they, they have a lot of coal reserves but they don't exploit it that in a timely manner to supply their coal power plants in time so these are some of the issues uh, in the region uh, and in this region how regional cooperation is going to help so to uh, uh, you know, overcome these issues, what should we do? Obviously, we have to add more generation capacity. If you look at uh, generation capacity shortages as an issue, we need to uh, add generation capacity. Because as I said, 300 million people do not have electricity. And uh, of course, at the least cost. You should not be developing whatever you have if the, it is not at the least cost, because eventually, these costs will have to be uh, recovered from the consumers or from somewhere uh, in the system and cleaner the better naturally if you can make it uh, cleaner that's the best way to uh, develop these resources and 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 generate electricity of course it may not be the best uh, uh, solution at certain times but uh, cleaner the better and naturally we have to rapidly expand transmission and distribution if you are talking of access to electricity uh, and quality of supply uh, uh, you know security of supply to the consumers which means we need to find financing from both public and private, uh, uh, you know, uh, sector, uh, you know, uh, you know, investors, simply because the public sector cannot alone uh, uh, do this job. You you need enormous amount of resources to invest in the generation transmission and distribution sectors if you are to develop, uh, uh, you know, the power sector in the region and 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 even with regional cooperation. How regional cooperation is going to help? The first and foremost is the bigger market. If you have a, ma a bigger market, uh, obviously it's it's uh, easier to find financing. Naturally, because the financiers, the investors will look for the market. If you have a bigger market, it's easier to finance, and naturally uh, the risks are lower if you have uh, uh, a bigger market. And uh, so infrastructure development is cheaper when you have a bigger market. So that's what's one of the most important things when it comes to financing uh, in a in an interconnected system. And naturally, the other important thing is that you have opportunities to share expertise and experience. And uh, of course, even without uh, you know regional cooperation, you may be able to do so. But if you have regional cooperation in the sector, you know uh, you know that's much easier because you have systems and the and the institutions in place for uh, such experience and expertise to be shared. And the other important thing, as I said, lower fossil fuel based generation. If you have more cleaner sources which can be shared across the borders, naturally the need for fossil fuel generation will go down 
as a result naturally it helps the environment so lower fossil fuel based generation is is something what is most important when it comes to environmental side and the environmental impacts so any hydropower unit generated in nepal or bhutan can bring down the uh, fossil fuel generation in in india which is going to help help the environment then of course uh, lower reserve capacity requirements i don't have to uh, go back into power system lectures naturally in an interconnected system you need lower uh, reserve uh, requirements when it comes to generation capacity as against island and individual country systems and that be, all these finally will be uh, reflected as costs in your uh, electricity tariffs and then reduce power deficits as i said most of the countries experience power deficits and if you uh, uh, have interconnected systems naturally you can share resources when there are excess resources in one side you can share it with the others so that uh, uh, you know power deficits can be reduced if you don't have regional cooperation or regional infrastructure you cannot do that and then of course as eventually you will have improved reliability of supply because if you have uh, you know sudden issues uh, in your own system you can always borrow or rather import uh, you know power from the other side now if you are going to individual areas india nepal power interconnections now as i said india uh, you know nepal at the moment of course there are certain power interconnections being uh, implemented but overall uh, power imports in the short term if you have interconnections between india and nepal as i said nepal is experiencing enormous uh, uh, power shortages therefore in the short and the medium term it's likely that the power imports will come from uh, uh, india to nepal and in the long term naturally it will be export of power from nepal to india because nepal has enormous hydropower resources and uh, there are uh, there is a, a large capacity transmission line being uh, uh, constructed at the moment 1000 megawatts uh, between india and nepal uh, and uh, the uh, second cross border line is is being talked about but at the moment there are small uh, power transfers you know uh, uh, between the two countries about 100 to 150 megawatts through 132 kV and 33 kV lines, again, but they are operated uh, under uh, island uh, mode because uh, they are not synchronized uh, systems in Nepal and India. So uh, Bangladesh India power interconnection uh, import to Bangladesh because Bangladesh is the is the country which needs power at the moment and uh, which is uh, not lacking resources except uh, uh, gas, uh, which is also depleting. and the other important thing is that bangladesh can be the transit country for power uh, transfer from uh, the northeast india to the northern part of india because as you know india india uh, geographically the northeast india is almost separated from the rest of india uh, only connection is through what you call chicken neck it's like like a chicken neck and the width of that uh, uh, you know uh, corridor is roughly about uh, 20 20 to 30 kilometers, and you cannot bring large capacity transmission lines uh, mm -hmm. through that. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of them. So you need uh, space, and and Bangladesh can easily offer that space uh, as a transit country to bring uh, you know uh, power from northeast India, which is hydro rich, also gas rich, and uh, so that can be uh, uh, you know the transit uh, through India. to bangladesh to the northern part of india uh, where uh, demand is and of course bangladesh can tap off power from that uh, line and and develop their own uh, uh, you know meet their own requirements uh, then bhutan india interconnections bhutan has been exporting to uh, uh, india for a long time and uh, and it can continue and uh, of course bhutan imports during the lean periods the important thing is that most of these hydropower plants whether it's bhutan or nepal they are all run on the river plants because one reason of course the geology uh, is not so good for storage power plants uh, and the plus of course uh, developing uh, high storage power plants is very expensive and uh, so uh, bhutan uh, has almost all the power plants are on the river power plants and that means the uh, the river flows go down during the uh, winter uh, because these are all snow fed uh, rivers and during the winter to roughly about 20% of the peak uh, uh, flows so it's very very low during the lean periods and the power need to be imported from india to bhutan to satisfy their own demand sometimes so that 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 is a possibility and that's happening now uh, and then if you look at uh, the uh, the uh, you know eastern sorry uh, you know western side 
of India, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India. Uh, now, Afghanistan and Pakistan are basically the, the uh, link to the Central Asian uh, region, uh, South Asia to Central Asian region. In the short term, naturally, Pakistan will have to import power from India. Pakistan is uh, going through severe power shortages these days because of lack of generation. And you can import from India. You may wonder what, why are we talking about uh, power importing from India. India itself is experiencing power shortages. But you wouldn't believe India has uh, almost 100,000 megawatts of idling generation capacity sitting in India, not being used. There are no takers for that generation. Simple reason, the price. And there are no takers at the price, at the price which they can sell electricity. So there is nobody to, uh, you know, uh, uh, buy power at the cost of supply. So they are idling. But uh, they are, so they are running too short. So if you have uh, countries which can offer better prices, can buy power, because as you know, uh, in India generation is a de-licensed operation. So you don't have to have a license to generate in, in India. You can put up your generation plant. If you have a, a customer somewhere, you can wheel power. You can pay for this transmission services and send power to anybody you want if there is somebody to buy power. Unfortunately, for this 100,000 megawatt, there are no takers because uh, the state electricity boards are running at a huge loss and they would rather cut off their customers rather than uh, supplying electricity to them because it's, it's much cheaper to cut off them rather than uh, supplying them. So, if uh, Bangladesh has a power shortages, it's very uh, much better off uh, by buying power from India, which is available in the market. So, in the long term, naturally, uh, you know, import hydropower from Central and West Asia region to uh, South Asia, as I said, enormous uh, hydropower resources in that region. Getting down to India, Sri Lanka interconnection. Uh, Obviously, uh, we have been talking about this for many, many years, as you know, uh, from 1970s, we have been talking about it. But we have uh, started revisiting this uh, in uh, somewhere around uh, mid, uh, somewhere around 2006 or so, and ADB has been assisting that process also. And uh, we are looking at a submarine cable, uh, which is going to help uh, for exchange of power. We can import power when we need, we can export power uh, when uh, we have excess power here. Obviously, that will help uh, uh, Sri Lankan investors, particularly the generators, uh, to find better markets because as you probably uh, know, India has a very well uh, operating power market actually, though uh, the amount of power going through the power exchange is not as high at the moment, but eventually it will develop into a pretty uh, good power market, it should. That's uh, how everything starts. And so, uh, if you have uh, uh, an interconnection, uh, 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 a corridor uh, from here to uh, 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 India, you can access that power market and that's good for the investors here, particularly the renewable energy investors here. And uh, then interconnections with Maldives, naturally Maldives is uh, you know uh, a very low demand, less than 300 megawatts in total inclusive of uh, resort islands. If you look at only uh, the inhabited island, it's only about 150 megawatts at the moment. So the demand is very low. And the distance from here is roughly about uh, uh, nearest point must be about uh, 700 kilometers. Otherwise, 700 kilometers submarine cable is not an issue. I was I was in uh, Oslo last uh, couple of weeks ago, and they were talking about a long uh, uh, submarine cable from uh, I think from Norway uh, uh, down to uh, the rest of Europe, about uh, seven eight hundred kilometers, which is which has recovered its investment within two years. Uh, because it's so lucrative to uh, uh, bring in uh, uh, hydropower from Norway to other parts of Europe. and But in this particular case, it's a distant poss possibility at this stage because of the low demand in Maldives and also, uh, you know, huge cost in Maldives interconnections. And as I said, uh, we did a, a study uh, on the economic benefits of six different <coughs> possible interconnections uh, in South Asia. These are interconnections which are either on the table or uh, been talked about and, 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 and quite serious six interconnections. And in fact, uh, at the time of uh, this study, uh, these, all these interconnections uh, uh, were being talked about, but now at the moment, at least two of those interconnections are in place already. If you look at the costs and benefits of these interconnections, six interconnections, you can very well see uh, the benefits uh, far outweighs the, 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 uh, the cost of uh, putting up those interconnections, which means uh, uh, naturally, it's good to have these interconnections or the or the uh, you know uh, the corridors for power transfer, 
and obviously these are uh, economic benefits in total as a region uh, if you want to really uh, split it between countries obviously it all depends on how you negotiate your border prices and uh, but what is most important is as a region we will we will uh, save a lot of money because of this interconnection because you share uh, cheaper uh, generation resources cleaner sources and at the same time you bring down uh, the the uh, you know unserved energy or the possibility that you not serve your demand will go down as soon as you interconnect these systems. So with all this taken into consideration, you can see the amount of money you save uh, is much more than what you spend on this interconnection. This is very, very important. So if you look at the barriers, obviously uh, there are barriers, a policy, regulatory uh, uh, environment, you have barriers for cross-border uh, cross trade. And uh, of course, uh, cross-border transmission infrastructure itself is, is a barrier, as I said, except, uh, you know, a few uh, interconnections. You don't have very many interconnections, even if you want to transfer power. And the other important thing is that the mutual understanding among key stakeholders on regional cooperation. Uh, you know, if you have understanding between policymakers, regulators, utilities and investors, naturally it's far easier to develop regional cooperation in energy. Uh, uh, it's not a, it's not just a question of money, but it also the question of uh, mutual understanding between. Uh, or I must say, it's not happening because of mutual misunderstanding uh, between different parties. Because always you look at your own benefits, uh, maybe uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of affected by the benefits uh, which others may reap, but you never look at what you lose if you are not interconnected. And in fact, I was asking this question when I was uh, talking to some of these. Uh, uh, you know, officials at Nord Pool. Nord Pool is the Nordic pool, which uh, you know handles roughly about uh, almost 25 percent of power trade in Europe. It's, it's, it's a huge amount of power. You're talking of about 500 uh, odd uh, terawatt hours uh, per uh, year uh, they handle. And uh, then Denmark at the moment, Denmark has a lot of wind power, as you know. And at, on that particular day, Denmark was pushing in about 60% of its demand with wind power. So I was asking them how you are going to handle this because wind power is so intermittent and if you if you have an islanded system, it's impossible to have 60% of your demand supplied with, with wind power because of uh, various stability issues. Then they said no because they are all interconnected. So then I said of course the beneficiary is Denmark. Uh, so uh, they are going to be the beneficiary all the time. They said no because demand also Denmark can, can provide a lot of support to other uh, countries when there is power shortages, power deficits uh, or, or the power at a higher cost. So the mutual benefit is the one which really makes uh, regional cooperation work and we need to understand that and not just our own benefits. Then of course what is most the other important thing is that all this will have to be recognized in laws and the policies you have. For instance, if, you, if I t tell you an example, uh, you know, Bangladesh and India, I will come to that a little later. Bangladesh and India, India, we have been supporting interconnections and Bangladesh is trying to access the uh, Indian power market uh, uh, through their interconnection. So they want to buy something from Indian power market straight away rather than going through long term uh, uh, power, power uh, purchase agreements with, with suppliers. And but the central electricity regulator in India does not have a regulation to uh, to help Bangladesh to allow this to happen. So, since it is not there in the regulations in the in the central electricity regulation regulator in in India, it cannot allow Bangladesh to access the power market in India. So that's an issue. Of course, uh, prime ministers have agreed to. Uh, you know, uh, uh, share trade power uh, between these two countries, but it will have to be reflected eventually in the policies, in the regulations, uh, in the laws you have, but otherwise you cannot uh, uh, go through this process. And of course, multilateral and bilateral agreements are to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, needs to be uh, there uh, for that purpose. If you look at India and Nepal, India and Bangladesh, you have bilateral agreements already in place for power trade. And then, uh, as I said, regulations relating to power market access. For instance, India, uh, Bangladesh does not have, even though they have interconnections, they do not have regulations, uh, uh, you know, helping them to access the power market in India. And uh, 
then of course tariff regulation uh, uh, for cross border trade who is going to regulate tariffs for cross border trade you know the regulators can regulate within their own countries but whose jurisdiction it is going to be for the cross border trade so these are issues which you need to address and then open access to transmission as i just said in india uh, if you have a buyer if you are a generator you can sell power to any buyer anybody who is ready to buy power uh, from my generator all what i have to do is to pay for the transmission services so these are established these are established numbers and the regulator uh, you know comes up with these numbers you pay for those services you deliver power and i get my money so that's called open access to transmission and open access to transmission is not available in any of the other countries in the region except in india india had this even before so called power sector reforms they have had it for a long long time but not neither in sri lanka in fact in sri lanka it's prohibited in the law if i can remember right and uh, uh, to access no, no open access and so these are things what you need to address if you are looking at regional cooperation and and a common market the grid codes uh, need to be kind of harmonized at least for cross border trade and then you have to have a cross border transmission plan because if you, your transmission system may may have a different uh, 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 topology uh, if you uh, consider or not consider uh, cross border trade because if it is cross border trade you have to make sure that whatever you uh, get at the border will have to be evacuated or uh, through the border so that will have to be looked at then the transmission charges and and the most important thing is mechanism for dispute resolution if there is a dispute what are you going to do and how we are going to deal with it of course we have to come back uh, uh, with something which is acceptable to everyone for instance in in our uh, you know for instance if you look at bangladesh india interconnection since uh, we have supported adb has supported that investment uh, eventually uh, we have come up with dispute resolution in according in in singapore uh, in in uh, according to the laws of uh, of, of singapore so likewise you have to come up with uh, you know a dispute resolution mechanism act acceptable to all so these are issues we have to uh, uh, look at but the most important thing is that to overcome these barriers we have si more or less uh, uh, systems in place if you really want to overcome these barriers one of them is in fact uh, you know we have uh, what you call south asia sub regional economic cooperation that's a uh, adb act as a secretariat for this and it's a grouping which is accepted by the countries <coughs> in south asia and then you have sark uh, energy working group uh, you know uh, that is an established mechanism which you can use to overcome some of these barriers discuss sit down and discuss then of course we have numerous inter intergovernmental meetings uh, every every year you have so many of them where you you see this uh, uh, you know officials uh, you you meet them and you can discuss and resolve lot of issues in other in, in addition to that you have bilateral interactions if you like india sri lanka interconnection you have bilateral interactions you have uh, share uh, sharing committee set up you have working group set up and you can use those to overcome those barriers and then the institutionally it's important uh, uh, that we have nodal uh, agency for power trading at least in small countries and of course as you probably know we have what you call south asia uh, forum for infrastructure regulators that's called safir that's a forum which you can use <coughs> to again resolve some regulatory issues discuss and resolve regulatory issues this is something very similar to uh, what you have in europe in fact you don't have an uh, all powerful uh, uh, regional regulator to regulate uh, power markets in in europe they have an association where there is in, uh, uh, enough understanding adequate understanding between different regulators in individual countries to sort out their own issues so it's only an institutional mechanism which is required you may not need to have uh, an all powerful institution to deal with it and then we recently we uh, supported setting up of what you call sasec uh, transmission utility forum uh, to uh, uh, for the transmission utilities dealing with uh, cross border trade to interact with each other to resolve any technical issues so these are some of the uh, uh, mechanisms in place already to resolve any issues and discuss and in terms of uh, adb of course since i am from adb i thought it's appropriate for me to talk a little bit of what we are doing and in fact regional cooperation is one of the key objectives of in uh, uh, adb strategy 2020 where we uh, spell out exactly how we are going to move forward in our uh, interventions in the region and we obviously would support uh, a fully interconnected regional electricity transmission network and develop necessary power generation for the use of the whole region sometimes and establishing uh, integrated power market and so on 
So uh, I don't want to go into details, but we have been doing this not in only in South Asia, but also in other countries. We are doing it in, in Greater Mekong region, the region associated with the Mekong River and the regions around the Mekong River, where you have large hydropower potential uh, uh, to develop. And that is has been happening for many years uh, with ADB's leadership. And then we have Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation, CAREC, in the West Central uh, uh, Asian region. Uh, where we have uh, about 10 countries put together and we help regional cooperation in that uh, mainly to share uh, hydropower resources and gas resources. <coughs> in fact, uh, sharing of gas resources have even advanced more than hydropower resources uh, uh, in, in that region. Uh, and uh, then, uh, you know, one of them, of course, in that region is a flagship uh, CASA project, which is basically 1000 megawatt uh, Central Asia, South Asia uh, power transmission project. And uh, the other one is Tapi gas pipeline project uh, where we are trying to bring in gas uh, from the Central Asian region to, through Afghanistan, Pakistan to India. Now that has advanced quite a lot as against Casa uh, uh, 1000. And uh, as I said, Greater Mekong region is basically uh, you know covering roughly about uh, 2.5 2 million square kilometers with about over 300 million people and around Mekong River and we have uh, been supporting a lot in regional cooperation particularly in the energy sector in that particular area and uh, in the case of south asia of course we have been supporting as i said secretariat uh, for sasec and uh, then uh, you know we have been supporting sasec working group and uh, we in fact uh, uh, did the sark regional energy trade study which is almost the bible for uh, regional cooperation uh, uh, in this uh, in South Asia and subsequently we uh, we had the South Asia regional power exchange study done both these studies have been tabled uh, in SARC fora and and endorsed by the SARC energy ministers so these two basically act as the basis on which we uh, usually lend in the region whether it's uh, uh, individual countries or cross-border uh, infrastructure then as I said we have supported transmission uh, uh, utility forum which is in fact a forum to share uh, experience and, and resolve any issues uh, uh, on, on technical matters when it comes to cross-border trade. And uh, in terms of project assistance, in fact, of course, compared to what Bhutan has, uh, these uh, Dagachu and Nikachu are not so big projects, but important thing, these two projects are basically export-oriented projects. So ADB has assisted uh, uh, these two projects and the related transmission links to export this power to India. And Bangladesh, India, as I said, we supported uh, 500 megawatt, 400 kV HVDC interconnection. Uh, in fact, Bangladesh, India interconnection is first ever grid to grid interconnection in South Asia and real grid to grid interconnection in South Asia. And we are now uh, providing uh, assistance to add, enhance uh, power transit from 500 to 1000 megawatts. So that's a very successful project from our point of view and for uh, Bangladesh and India both. And of course, we facilitate transactions, uh, you know, in the case of Bangladesh, we help them a lot to negotiate power purchase agreements and to access power market and so on. And uh, also, uh, you know, possible support for uh, additional transmission facilities, as I said, when you have this large uh, uh, capacity transmission link, which uh, they are talking about from Northeast India to the Northern India through Bangladesh, we are looking at about 6,000 megawatt transmission link and 2,000 megawatts of uh, power tapped off in Bangladesh. So it's a huge uh, investment which needs billions of dollars and uh, of course with the help of other multilateral partners we are going to be in it. And Nepal, India, uh, we have been supporting uh, transmission facilities for power evacuation towards the border because as I said, it's not just the cross-border infrastructure which matters, but also uh, the in-country transmission systems to evacuate power towards the border. <coughs> Otherwise, how, how are you going to transfer this power? And we are supporting feasibility study of the second cross-border line, big uh, thousand megawatt line, which is going to be established between the two countries. And also, we are supporting a 350 megawatt, uh, what we call Dudkoshi uh, hydropower project, which of course will have excess power uh, during uh, the uh, uh, rainy season and which needs to be exported to India. And that project we are supporting uh, with some uh, PPP or public-private partnership elements in it. India, Sri Lanka, I don't have to uh, elaborate. I'm sure most of the uh, CEB engineers uh, know this. And we have been uh, supporting uh, interactions between the two countries uh, to uh, develop this. And in fact, this is the detailed engineering study of this particular line is in our country program. 
and eventually i hope we will be able to support uh, the uh, entire investment with with other development partners so you are talking about of half a billion dollars of investment here uh, between the two countries and a few final remarks as i said uh, obviously regional cooperation helps it's a win win situation for all it's important that we look at uh, not only what we lose but also what we gain by regional cooperation don't think of always what we lose by not ha having regional cooperation it's important then uh, obviously if you look at it you will see it's a win win situation for everybody in the game and the difference may be you may win at a certain time you may lose uh, for the others for the benefit of others at certain other time but eventually everybody will win and uh, so naturally the development of the power sector will be catalyzed by regional cooperation as i said bigger the market the higher the chances that you can bring in investors and bring down the costs that's that's a, a natural uh, thing and so that will definitely catalyze regional cooperation for instance nepal and bhutan will never be able to develop their large hydropower resources without interconnections to india without regional cooperation because nepal and bhutan they are the, just small countries so if you need to develop those resources for the benefit of the region you need to have those interconnections and regional cooperation and as i said it requires recognition in policies laws and regulations which can be easily handled by individual countries and as i said ex existing institutions and the fora can handle most of the issues which we have to deal with it's only a matter of sitting and discussing and resolving issues if we want to resolve those issues and as i said whether we like it or not india is sitting in the middle and india is the biggest market and obviously having access to indian market helps everybody around and all what we have to do is to sit and try to uh, agree and and uh, discuss and agree with these countries to access the indian market which i am sure eventually will be opened up for everybody and that is going to help everybody in the region and of course uh, we have a major role to play as multilateral development banks because you may not trust each other in the region but you trust uh, generally these multilateral banks so we can be in the middle as uh, as the intermediary in most of the cases and i am happy to tell you that in most of the regional cooperation related work we have been pretty successful take bangladesh india and Bang uh, 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 india and nepal and particularly smaller countries would like to have institutions like us helping them to negotiate things with with uh, big countries of course the big countries would love to do it by themselves they always love bilateral discussions naturally because it's it's easier but uh, we have a bigger role to play and we can play that role very well because all these countries are members of of adb and the world bank and the like so with that uh, let me conclude thank you very much and i hope uh, you uh, benefited from uh, these few thoughts thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Vijay Tunga. We will next now move on to the next item. That's a presentation of a memento to the speaker as a token of appreciation for accepting our invitation and delivering the today's lecture. I would call upon the president-elect, Engineer M. S. N. Kamake. We have come almost to the end of our today's proceedings. I will request uh, call upon Engineer Kosala Kamura Deniya to propose the vote of thanks and conclude the proceedings. Good evening. Engineer Vimala Senegamage, President elect Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka, Engineer Shavindranath Fernandu, immediate past president, ISL, Engineer Ms. Arundhati Vimala Surya, Executive Secretary, ISL, Guest Speaker, <coughs> Engineer Dr. Priyanta Vijayatunga, Principal Energy Specialist, Asian Development Bank, Past Presidents, Vice Presidents, Council Members, Members of IESL, Family Members of Late Engineer DJ Vimala Surendra, 
members of electrical and electronics engineering section committee and ladies and gentlemen first and foremost on behalf of the institution of engineers sri lanka ya esl let me thank engineer dr priyanta vijayatunga for readily accepting our invitation and flying the all, flying all the way from manila near nearly to deliver this lecture as our guest speaker for this prestigious in engineer dj vimala surendra memorial lecture which is which as you all know is one of the most important annual events as president elect mentioned <laughs> moreover we are indeed thankful to you for selection of one of the most appropriate topics given an insight into regional potential in renewable energy generation and cross border opportunities also we really appreciate and so grateful to the family members of dj vimala surendra for being with us on this memorial day also on behalf of electrical and electronics engineer sectional committee i would like to thank president elect engineer sp vijay kong president president sorry president engineer sp vijay kong president elect mr senagamage immediate past president shavindrat fernando and executive secretary engineer ms arundhati vimala surya and the sector rate for making this event a success also last but not not least ladies and gentlemen let me thank past presidents vice president council members invitees and every one of you for taking time to be with us to participate in this year's engineer dj vimala surendra memorial lecture thank you very much <laughs>